you know, the props assistant shooting herself in the foot. That's ironic. Yeah. Also, the fact that the first assistant director worked on The Crow. There's a saying in the film industry called The Curse of The Crow. You know, the, the movies The Crow are cursed. Hi, my name's Baby Drip, and this video features Lane Looper. He was the first camera assistant on the movie set of Rust. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed after Alec Baldwin's prop firearm discharged. This is a super important interview that you don't want to miss. Now let's see what Mr. Lane Looper has to say for himself. Where I think we're all vaccinated. Yeah. And third book. <laughs> You're on your third one too? I got my third book. Ready to get it. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, it's <laughs> Okay. So I'm going to start recording. Yeah. Okay, Lane, um, first of all, thank you for meeting with me. I know I've been trying to arrange some interviews, been trying to get a hold of you, and Jake assisted with that, so I appreciate that. No, thank you. Um, ba basically, I'm just going to get your basic information, uh, name, date of birth, if I can get that. Yes, yes. Lane, L-A-N-E, Looper, L-U-P-E-R, date of birth. Your official title is? And the A camera first <laughs> AC. A camera first AC. first AC. Just confirm your phone number for me, please. Five zero five. Eight six zero one. Okay, and <laughs> got it. <laughs> Perfect, Lane. Before I begin any questioning, since you do have a lawyer retained, um, here's your waiver of rights and your lawyer can look at that too. Yeah. Once you guys are done reading that, if you could just initial the boxes. And if I'll explain everything later, once he gets back. Sure. I really appreciate what you're doing. I'm very busy. No, it's, it's okay. I appreciate you meeting because I'm trying to set all these yeah. interviews and some people are answering, some are not. Yeah, I've, you know, since That's day one, when you guys were like interviewing, it's going to be a lot of interviews. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to help you do your job. I appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, would you hand me a coaster? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I'll get a coaster too. Just in case. I'll read that over. Mm -hmm. And once you're done, if you can just, you can either check mark the boxes or initial. I'll just check mark. And then, Jake, if you'd like to be a witness. Uh, let me have my paralegal do that since. Okay, Lane, let's start uh, just with a couple of questions regarding, um, you know, what the demeanor was there at the set since the beginning. Um, when did you get there? Uh, and we're talking specifically about uh, October 21st. Uh, we're talking about from the beginning. I'm going to go back to the beginning okay. of when uh, the film started and when you started working uh, there at the film set. Sure. Um, from the beginning of the show, you know, uh, going back to when I was first negotiating with uh, the production about everything, there was a, an air of amateurishness. A lot of people didn't really know kind of what to do, and I had to guide both production how to download footage, you know, how to back things up, what they should do. Um, they were leaning on like some prior experiences, but going into the production, everything felt very unplanned and hastily put together. Uh, <clears throat> we went into prep at Keslo Camera, um, which is when I first uh, saw Helena here in New Mexico. I had previously met her in Los Angeles, but um, I saw her in New Mexico and started putting together the cameras. It took us uh, three days to put the, together the cameras, which is actually kind of um, a short schedule. Uh, normally when we do like an anamorphic show, which is the type of lenses we use, mm -hmm. we need a little bit of extra time. Um, and uh, it wound up just being three days. So it was all kind of, everything was still being put together quite quickly. Um, day one on the show, you know, everything, it felt kind of rushed, 
like there was a lot to do in a day. I think our first day we had, you know, five and a half pages worth of material to do. And in a Western, that's, that's kind of like a tall order. Okay. Um, there was, you know, we, we got to set. It was just rush, rush, rush from day one. And I never really dialed down from that. Um, but there was like no, no order to our day to day, um, comings and goings. There was no, uh, we're going to tackle this. We're going to tackle this. It was very spur of the moment. Like, all right, we're going to put some actors in this frame. Um, there's kind of an order that we usually do things, which is we block the scene first, then we light it and then we shoot it. And oftentimes we were putting cameras out there and just putting actors in the frame without any, any direction as to what we were doing. Okay. Do you know the date that you uh, started there on set? Started on set? Yeah. Uh, or the date of filming, I should say. Yeah, yeah, that would be in October, if you don't want to know what it is. No, yeah, you're fine. So, that would have been October. Uh, it was on Wednesday, October. October 6th. Okay. I don't have a calendar on me, so I can't look physically at it. Want me to verify that? And let yeah. you look at a cal calendar? If you don't mind, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was Wednesday, October 6th. It was our first day of principal photography. We had a day off on October 5th, and October 4th on Monday was our last day of prep. Okay. And what is the day-to-day -day basis starting in the morning? From what I hear, you know, they start at, call is at 6.30 a.m. Uh, what do you guys... First day, the camera department had a 30-minute pre-call. So our first, uh, we were in at 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the general crew call time was 6.30 in the morning. And it stayed 6.30 for the, all except two days on the show that I can remember. <laughs> okay. So every day at 6.30 a.m. Uh -huh. Uh, it was just the first day that we had a pre-call. I had asked for some uh, to get help get us ahead, kind of organized beforehand, but uh, was was turned turned down for them. Okay. What happens at uh, call in the morning? Is there call sheets? Yeah. That so everybody normally, gets. Normally, we get a call sheet the day before filming. Um, uh, if it's on a filming day, we get it at wrap usually. Um, but uh, it's a call sheet. Tells us when to be there. Uh, tells us what work we're going to do that day who's our actors, what props we need for that day. Um, on the back of the call sheet, it'll have everybody on the crew's individual call time. Um, so for day one, the entire camera department uh, had a 6 a.m. call time. Uh, uh, yeah, that's what the call sheet is. Um, as far as okay. us getting there, we got there at 6 a.m., put together our monitor card because um, we didn't have enough time to do it at the prep. So my utility, Jonas Huerta, and my loader, uh, Colby Hopkins, he worked together to put together the monitor cart um, while uh, we were putting together the cameras and generally getting everything out of the truck and onto the, to the uh, carts. Um, Helena, part of the vision of this whole movie, they had these uh, interstitial shots. So very early in the morning, Helena and, uh, was there at the truck going like, all right, well, I want you know, a camera on a 40 millimeter and B camera on a 75 to get these shots of the sunset. Mm -hmm. And uh, my camera went off to shoot specifically some horses trotting by at Corral. Uh, it was uh, me, Andy Graham, uh, my second assistant, Daniel Maestas, and our script supervisor eventually walked over along with Zach Sneesby, the boom operator. And we were just doing insert shots of the horse walking by our camera. Okay. Um, was there any safety bulletins on those call sheets? No. No? Not from day one. Okay. Is there usually, from your experience, is there... Every, every time you have anything to do with anything that could involve safety for that day, mm -hmm. uh, we sent a, they have a list of about 50 industry-wide safety bulletins that are put out by the Contract Services Administrative Trust Fund. Um, they're basically the, for lack of a better term, they're kind of like the corporation that's the liability shield for the producers. We all know these safety bulletins, and they're required usually 
I shouldn't say required, it's industry best practice that every time you have anything to do with anything that could be in one of the safety bulletins, it's actually included with the call sheet. Um, so, you know, shooting into Mexico on a location like this, they always like include like the critters one, be careful about snakes and and whatnot. Anytime there's firearms that said, uh, safety bulletin number one and five, like need to accompany the call sheet because that's live ammunition and safety awareness. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, anytime stunts, stunts has, uh, is, is, uh, safety bulletin number four. Um, you know, these are very important things that need to go with the call sheet because they're going to give you the best practices for the day. It's literally an instruction manual. Okay. But this one particular, particularly on and this, this movie, that didn't have any safety bulletins that you can remember. Uh, this movie never, to, to my best recollection, ever sent out any um, safety bulletins whatsoever with any call sheets and looking at previous emails I haven't seen them okay. myself on any of those call sheets or emails um, the only things that were ever included with our emails were a map of how to get there a map of the property that we were shooting at it was a map of the town um, uh, rules and regulations for working on Bonanza Creek Ranch and then the call sheet itself that was the only thing that was ever included as an attachment Okay, and fast forward, fast forwarding a little bit to that day of the incident. Um, I know you guys walked. If I have this correct, you guys walked the day before offset. No. So what happened was, is the day before October twentieth, um, we had tendered our resignation to the company um, after that. Um, everybody in the camera department individually made their choice to leave the show. This was not any kind of organized walk off. Um, you know, we all just kind of had a hit a limit with the show, and uh, we all tendered our resignation uh, to production after after we had wrapped. Um, and the following morning is when we came in to gather all of our equipment. Okay, the following morning on the twenty yeah, first. Correct. The only okay. thing that I gathered the day before on the twentieth was I had uh, had this big one hundred and forty pound uh, remote head. This is the thing you put on the crane so you can remote control the camera. Mm -hmm. I took that home along with a couple of things that I had been giving the production for free. Okay. Um, during the filming, I know, you know, this is a Western movie. There's a lot of um, firing and henna being the armor. Mm -hmm. uh, does she ever have a safety call where she gathers everybody and says, hey guys, here's some earplugs. If we're going to be shooting in the next shot. So we were never, we never had a proper safety meeting in regards to a lot of the gun firing. There was one safety meeting on day three that was uh, that gathered the whole crew, and then another one on. Um, uh, Jesus, I'm gonna say it was. I'm gonna say it was day four, day five. You guys have you that one day. There was a yeah. There was another safety meeting. There was two safety meetings done on the show. That actually gathered the whole crew. Um, day three on October eighth. I have to look at the call sheets for the second one. I know we were specifically shooting at the town that we shot Manhattan in, but the second safety meeting was in regards specifically to the strike that was coming up. Because mm -hmm. um, they just authorized the, we just had the strike authorization vote, and so they had a safety meeting thing. We're, we're not on that contract. You guys wouldn't need to strike if you needed to. We support you, but you can't strike because it's not on this contract kind of safety meeting. It wasn't an actual meeting about oh. safety. The first one was on day three. It was our first gunfight, and really <laughs> the subject of that safety meeting was, this is our armor, Hannah Gutierrez. She will be doing guns for the whole show, and that was basically it. There wasn't an explanation of like the day's work really done. But those are the only two safety meetings that I can recall on the show that at all. <clears throat> she did pass out ear protection, but it was inadequate ear protection. That's actually what kind of gave me my first warning sign about Hannah. Uh, every armor I've ever worked with in the past carries a what are called cans over here protection, which are mm -hmm. used them on the range. Yeah. Um, every armor I know carries them. She didn't. She she had just a squishy ear. Oh, that's so I can't I can't use them because they can ear infections. And to your experience, is there?
safety meetings by the armor um, on set every time they're going to use firearms mm -hmm. that day. Okay. They, what they do is they'll do a morning safety meeting. If there's any kind of stunts, firearms, uh, anything they do with anybody's safety, they will do a, a safety meeting at the at call. Um, it will usually be at crew call. They'll have a 10 minute long safety meeting explaining our day's work. Uh, the first assistant director will usually call on the armor to speak. Uh, in regards to what we were doing. Um, and then if it's a big enough thing, we'll actually have another safety meeting before any stunt or any, you know, gunfight. Um, so they'll explain what's going to happen in the shot, what loads that they're going to use. And uh, yeah, this was, this, this happens on almost every show that I've ever been on in, in my tenure career. Okay. Um, in regards to this show, we occasionally would know what load they were using, but we would never really have a proper safety meeting explaining what the shot was. Okay. Did you ever witness any recklessness on scene? Uh, reckless handling of firearms was a big one. Um, and there was a lot of like taking guns from people and like putting them under her arms or carrying rifles like in a bundle of sticks almost. There was at one point where they were loading a firearm and, and a rifle got pointed at the props assistant's face and neither of them realized that they were doing it. Uh, there were two negligent discharges on October 16th. Um, Let's go back to the, when they were carrying guns and bundles and you know, mm -hmm. the barrels were pointed different directions. Do you know who was uh, holding those guns at that time? Yeah, it was Hannah. Hannah okay. Um, her department was like, uh, woefully understaffed uh, a gunfight movie like this should have more than one person handling um should, should have more people in the props department in general and uh hannah was doing the job of two people she was a props assistant and an armor which is uh insanely overstaffing like her understaffing i should say it's 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 kind of an absurdity in the business period to do something like that because this show it was all guns it, everybody had a gun it's a Western, you know, yeah. people have guns in their holsters, people have rifles on, on the wall, you know. And it was her and two very inexperienced people in her department that were, were handling all of this, plus propping people. Okay. Let's go into the negligence of our accidental discharges that happened on scene. You said there, you've heard of two or did you witness two? I witnessed two. I was, yep. there, I was present for both uh, negligent discharges on October 16th. <clears throat> and what did you see? Uh, the first negligent discharge was inside of a cabin set. Um, uh, to the best of my recollection, it was um, the double um, who was handling the firearm. Uh, and it literally just went off in his hand. He didn't pull the trigger. He was like, whoa, um, when it went off. And we were inside of a cabin, so it was me. Helena's monitor was just behind me. Uh, Joel's mo monitor, he was sharing a monitor with Helena. They were just behind me. Andy Graham, our shot was looking out the door. He was by the door. And uh, the double, he was right next to the door when the first one went off. And the second one? The second one was just outside of the cabin and later on in the day. Um, it was, it was uh, like 15 minutes later. It wasn't, it wasn't later on the day. It was literally like 15 minutes later. Um, the props assistant, uh, I believe her name's Nicole, uh, she was handling, uh, what I believe to be the same firearm. And, uh, the reason why I remember it so well is because she literally shot herself in the foot with it. And she, you know, I her, she, it went off and she was like, ow. Um, and she had said she shot herself in the foot with this blank. And that's actually the moment after that I texted, uh, Ro Walters, the unit production manager about mm -hmm. the negligent discharges on the show. And that it's just a super unsafe environment. Did it happen with the revolver or long rifle? Revolver. Both times was revolver? Yeah. Okay. And I know you said that you uh, sent a, 
a letter to Ro, who's the unit production manager, mm -hmm. if I have it correct. correct. What was uh, your concern? Um, what all did you put in there? In that letter? My text message uh, read, there have been three negligent discharges because I was including a prior a um, special effects explosion on day three. Um, there had been three negligent discharges on the show so far. Uh, this is super unsafe. Uh, to which she responded to me, uh, uh, two guns went off, question mark, awesome, sounds good. Uh, awesome sounds good was in relation to uh, how long it was going to take us to wrap out that night, I believe. Uh, and then I said to her, yes, two today, one on day one, or one on day three, or week one, sorry, one on week one. So it was a text message, you know, regarding the negli negligent discharge. What, what did she reply to you? What did, who's in charge of... You know, correcting such issue. She is. She's Her in charge of the line producer. Our yeah. uh, Gabrielle Pickle, they're directly responsible for handling something like that. That's why it, it, our our line of communication to the producers and the people in charge is the unit production manager. Mm -hmm. um, so I let the unit production manager know there have been two. Uh, in the text message, it literally said there have been three negligent discharges on the show. Uh, this is super unsafe, and she responded to me asking about the guns going off, and I, and I explained that there have been two today on October 16th, and one in week one, uh, referring to the um, special effects explosion that went off on day three. Um, I was letting them know because they needed to, to, they needed to fire her. It, it was, there, there, <laughs> there's only ever been one other negligent discharge that I've ever known personally about, which was on a show called The Unsettling, and that person was fired that moment. And I had worked on a show even uh, years and years ago where there was a there was an issue with a minigun that it kind of it, that it, it tipped over, and the armor was immediately fired, walked off the set because you're dealing with something that gets in life. It's, it's there's a reason why it's safety bulletin number one. This is a deadly thing. And so I was alerting the producers to this so that they could make a correction immediately. And it was, well. What's your experience? What's your experience? How long have you been working as a A camera operator? I've been an A camera first AC for the past four years as a department head. Okay. Um, I've been in the business for ten years. Uh, if you include my very first thing as a sound mixer, it'd be twelve. But uh, I've been working full-time in the film business for about 10 years. Been a member of the International Cinematographers Guild for seven years. Do you, can you kind of just give me a guesstimate of how many films you've worked on? Close to 60, 63, I think, the last count. Shorts, features, uh, television shows. If you include every episode of television I've worked on, which is almost considered a mini-movie, you're in the hundreds. And from your experience, like you were just saying, if uh, you know, gun was to accidentally go off, um, that the art would be terminated immediately. The armor would be yeah. terminated on the spot. It's not even a hey, we're going to wait till the end of the day. It is an on the spot thing, and the show normally will will stop for the day to reevaluate the safety procedures on the show. Um, but I've, I've never seen an armor keep. I've never heard of an armorer keeping their job whenever there's an issue with a firearm. Okay. What other concern did you have with uh, Roe? Did you type a letter other than the text message? Did you write a letter to unit production so, manager? Uh, you, in, in regards to like when I tendered my resignation? Yeah. Yeah, I did. When I, when I, when I gave my resignation letter uh, at the end of the show on the 20th, uh, I sent an email as soon as I got home um, kind of explaining all the reasons why I wanted show you know the first one being very lax COVID procedures the second one being gun safety lack of safety meetings lack of explanations to what's going on on the show excuses being given about not having enough time you know we can't we don't have time to rehearse you know we don't have time to to worry about that you know it's um the third reason was uh we were missing paychecks on the show um or pay was just flat out incorrect uh the fourth reason um being a housing situation, which was kind of important to me just because I had totaled my car driving home from Santa Fe after filming. Long hours. And 
Yeah, it wasn't even necessarily the longest day. It was, it was a 13 hour day and I, I sent my car off the road um, uh, in 2018 and I completely totaled it. Um, so I sent, uh, yeah, I sent a resignation letter explaining all of this to uh, Roe Walters, Gabrielle Pickle, the long producer. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, everybody in, in, in charge was copied on the email, except for the producers, which they block out their emails for us on the crew list. But um, otherwise, they would have sent the letter. Uh, Joel Souza, the director, also was copied on the email. Okay. Um, Gabrielle did respond to the email the following day at call time, uh, about 10 minutes after call, um, saying I needed to coordinate with her to, to, to not interrupt her day, but I had uh, already been unloading stuff and by the time she emailed me back. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to show you something really quick, yeah. and Jake, you can also look at this. Is this the letter you sent? Is that just the uh, double or just the last part of it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah this is uh, this is my resignation letter, yes. Correct. Okay. And at that point, uh, I know you have an important role as a you know a camera operator. Yeah. Um, did did Reed take over that position? No, Reed he so I'm a camera assistant. Uh, what I do is I, you know, my primary role on the show is to keep the cameras in focus. Mm -hmm. But I also run all the day to day going ons of everything. Um, Reed is a is a is a proper camera operator. His job solely is framing the shot and working with Helena for the creative side of things. Um, you can kind of think of our department as having like almost two sub areas whereas the camera operators are part of the creative side of everything and the camera assistants are part of all the technical and so i'm the head of the technical side of everything um whereas reed he's part of the, the creative side so he was the b camera operator um he stayed because helena legitimately begged him to stay because he he while we were unloading everything came in the camera truck and was like should i leave and i told him like you can do whatever you like you know, I am not telling anybody to come with me. You know, you can stay here and if you need hours for your health care, you know, stay on the show. It's the same thing I told everybody on the on the crew. Like yeah. nobody come with me. You know, that's it's it, it's you know I'm not trying to like get everybody to leave, you know. It was it was purely just a personal choice, you know. And are you the owner of the cameras that you took that day or were they leased uh, i was never i never took any cameras that day cameras stayed on the show um the only thing i took were things that belonged to me that were subleased through the rental house mm -hmm. um so it'd be like my wireless follow focus uh i took my personal monitors which is a seven inch monitor and a 17 inch monitor uh and then just personal tools uh tools and equipment that are part of my box rental um yeah, everything everything that was uh, taken from set was all personally owned by myself. Okay. Anything that was recorded uh, during the time of film? During the time of during the time of filming the movie okay. Rust, do you have any footage that you took home with you? No. No. Okay. I'm not allowed to take footage, but I did have access to the footage on the uh, daily service. To your knowledge, do you know if for rehearsals, do they record these rehearsals? Or is it rehearsal it's then? It's rare they record rehearsals. Uh, it sometimes is done on the camera, but most of the time, uh, what, most of the time, what they do, if there if there is a real rehearsal, it's, it's there is actually a, a little bit of a there's a little bit of, of something to think about here. They have this thing called shooting the rehearsal, which mm -hmm. is when you just roll on the rehearsal to see if you can capture the magic. Which is often it's just the first take. Yeah, it's, that's all it is. It's just an excuse to rush. Is you don't show the crew, you're just going to show them on on the film. So we don't get an opportunity to stop, lay marks, mark my follow focus, know where anybody is, set frames. It's literally just like all right, bring the set, roll on the rehearsal. Um, that was this show. Like there was no such thing as a rehearsal in this show. We would roll on the rehearsal, um, but that's just the first take. Um, as far as do we record real rehearsals on other shows, 
Uh, the cameras won't, but we'll use something called a video operator on those kind of shows, which is another person that actually is in between the, the feet of the cameras and the video village. And what they're doing is they're recording everything mm -hmm. so that somebody can watch it back later for um, purposes of matching. Okay. And they, whenever they record a rehearsal, those are the only people that record it. We don't actually put rehearsals on film unless you're on the show. Gotcha. Yeah, that's so good. And well, I'm starting it's, to. It's an annoying <laughs> misnomer. It bugs the hell out of me. I'm starting to understand a little bit about the, the film industry, but I mean, there's there's so much that. You got, you're gonna be an expert, buddy. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's crazy. Um, Starting your own production company, just pay people on time, be safe. I know, right? Um, do you know if the mics are ever uh, on while rehearsal? Not personally. It's not really my field of. of um, that's not really my field. So I know I've heard of some, some people that, you know, they're, they're, I, mean, I should say the mics are always on, they're just not always recording. They do, for the purposes of your investigation, eventually, if you ever get a hold of the footage, uh, they do pre-roll. So, the, so technically the recorders are always recording. Mm -hmm. And when the uh, sound recordist presses record, it actually writes the first 10 seconds prior to the button press. And it's just a kind of a safety thing, just in case they stay rolling and the sound mixer doesn't hear it, and you can just jump really quick to it and start recording. Okay, so gotcha. Pre-record yeah. ten seconds worth. Okay. <clears throat> the cameras don't do that, but the uh, sound does. Okay. But they don't. They don't usually run like a recording of sound during a rehearsal unless there is a a video operator, and they should have one of those. Okay. Um, also. One thing is uh, for the purposes of your investigation, I would definitely see if you can get a hold of those those photographer stuff because I think she was on them. Yeah, that was my. She wanted to speak to me. And yes, she. Uh, uh, yeah, she was there. She very specifically said, like, if you talk to the police, tell them they need to reach out to me. Did you notice any, while you were there on set, did you notice any animosity towards, um, you know, the actors or anybody else? No, actually, it's really funny. Um, I found Alec Baldwin. He was a bit of a pill to work with, but he was actually, like, a really nice guy. Like, you know, when, when you say rolling, he kind of gets into his character. He gets pumped up. He would do push-ups and stuff, just trying to get himself amped up. And uh, he'd have, like, a lot of energy. Um but he was actually really always safety conscious. There was at one point, and this is actually on the film, I know it's on the take, he, he had yelled at a city cam operator to get out of the way of his pistol because he, he'd come out and guns gun shooting on, it was October 16th actually when we were leaving the, the um, when we were at the cabin, his character comes up and runs up the hill while like, you know, running and taking cover. And uh, the steady cam operator got a little too close and with his shot, read. Uh -huh. And he stopped and was like, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? I got a gun, man. Like, back up. And then he starts going, back up to everybody else behind. You know, he was he was really actually pretty safety conscious about firearms. Um, there was no animosity in the cast. You know, uh, the cast of the show was wonderful. Um, Francis Fisher, if you give everybody hugs. You know, I was like, oh, my God, that's, that's Rose's mom in Titanic. <laughs> we all she was like super cool. And she was a sweetheart. And like in between takes, you know, Alec Baldwin, he, you know, he would all chat with us occasionally, especially with the um, people he had worked with before from Georgia. Um, but he was really nice. He was, he was really nice. He was just a pill to work with, but he was really nice. Like the cast was super cool. Especially the kid. The kid was really cool. He was like fascinated by my job. Like the kid would always come and hang out with me. Yeah. And so like in between takes and setups and, you know, and camera were setting up, I should give him my follow focus and be like, all right, kid, you're in. You're doing the shot. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the kid that Alec was yeah, supposedly yeah, running with. on. Show. Okay. He's in uh, the Mighty Duck series. Oh, okay. I'm starting to get the, you know, what the script was of that film and what was supposed to happen. So. Yeah, it's ironic. Yeah. The whole the, the script of the movie. There's a lot of irony that happened in the show because on day one, you know, the first assistant director plays an undertaker. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that was ironic. And then the arm, you know, the props assistant shooting herself in the foot. That's ironic. Yeah. Also, the fact that the first assistant director worked on The Crow. There's a saying in the film industry called The Curse of the Crow. You know, the, the movies The Crow are cursed. And so, Dave Hall's 
who, I, you know, through my investigation, I learned he was the first assistant director. Correct. He worked on The Crow? He worked on The Crow Salvation, the second movie. Oh, okay. The person who died on that one was Trini, who used to play the Yellow Power Ranger. Okay, well. It's, it's, it's just a saying in the film industry. Ed even said it a couple times on the show. It's like, oh, the guy in the on this one. It's like a curse of the crow. Thanks. And then, yeah, it trust me, I've been eating my words. Like, just, yeah, I've been sick to my stomach the whole time. <sighs> Anything else that you think you might want to get off your chest before we end this interview? Um... Oh yeah, the, the special effects explosion on the third day of shooting. Um, everyone was present for that. Uh, here's a, here's so, so let me, let me kind of paint a picture for how the goings on this set worked. Um, we had producers directly on set whose hands were in the day-to-day -day workings of things. Um, kind of almost acting as an assistant director or acting as a unit production manager. Specifically, uh, Ryan Winterstern and Nathaniel Klinger. Mm -hmm. um, they they had a hand in everything. They were on set every day. Um, both Will Walters and Ryan Winterstein would actually wear a walkie-talkie, which is completely alien for those positions to be done. So that means they were listening to Channel One. They knew everything was going on at all times. So when a when a dis, when any kind of discharge happens, you know it's a, it's a major safety concern. And so on day three, when that special effects explosion went off, that should have also been something that caused the set to pause. Uh, and it didn't. Um, what I really just want to drive home is, is there was so many people that were aware of everything that was going on, but did not act actively do anything to do, to, to change. Um, but yeah, that happened on day three, the special effects explosion. Um, I'm sure people told you about it. Yeah. They refer to it as the popper. Yeah. Like special effects popper. Pop, popper, yeah. It's like a little gunpowder charge that explodes. It was loud. And, you know, my ears were ringing for all day, the rest of that day. And then the following two days, like, it would just come and go. Um, so I have kind of tinnitus already, but it just made it horribly unbearable. Yeah. Um, incredibly loud. Uh, another question that I do have is, on set, when you were on set and filming, uh, assisting with filming, did it, what's the process of the armor giving the gun to who and then to the actor? How, did, how does that work? Yeah, so in a normal show, uh, the armor takes charge of the firearms 100% of the time unless they are in the actor. What happens is like in armor, in the, in the system we're shooting is is oftentimes uh, we will uh, hand the firearms right before we roll, not earlier than that. It would be the moment before we roll. The armor will provide the actors with the firearm. They will announce to the entire set themselves that it's a hot weapon. Uh, who, who says that? It's a hot armor. Armor. The armor. armor, and then the first assistant director will usually repeat it. Mm -hmm. But normally the armor is there on set playing an active role in the, the process, and everybody listens to them. It's, and the same, the same thing actually happens with special effects, except special effects says it's hot after we've been rolling, whereas the armor usually is ha happening right the moment as we're, before we're going to roll. And she'll announce that there's a hot weapon on set, and, you know, the actor will take charge of it. Uh, we'll roll the camera slate, we'll start shooting the scene, guns go off, um, they call cut, and it's the armor who, themselves who walks over and collects the firearms from them. They will clear the firearm. They will show the firearm to the first assistant director or anybody else if there is a clear, uh, that, that it has been cleared and all of the rounds have been taken out. Then they will announce there is a cold firearm. Now that's if we're actually shooting. Now mm -hmm. if they are using a, like a real firearm as a prop, like that it doesn't shoot, it's in a holster, they will still bring the firearm to set before we roll, not a moment before. They will open the chamber uh, shine a flashlight through the barrel, and they will show the camera operators, uh, the first assistant director, and really anybody nearby that there's a cold weapon on set. And then they'll, you know, breach it and you know put it in the holster as a prop. Um, but they will always announce themselves, and usually echoed by the first assistant director, that there is a hot weapon or a cold weapon on set. 
Okay. So from the armor, Hannah, in to this case, to the, to the first AD or no, straight no, to the actor? The first AD touching a firearm is a huge no-no. It is the armor to the actor to the armor. That's it. Those are the only people who, who should ever have charge of a firearm. Because oh, really? it goes from the armor into a lockbox. Like, they, they, like, the way a proper set works is firearms are the most dangerous thing we have, minus big explosions, big costly explosions, and those are rare. Firearms are the most common thing on set that can kill, maim, or injure. And so they take charge of those very seriously. Um, I have a really good friend, Joshua Aragon, uh, who, you know, he's a prop master, and he has a literal, like, gun lockup on his truck. It's a full-on lockup with combination locks out the wazoo. Like, guns are taken very seriously. Yeah. And so nobody ever should touch a firearm in between any of that. They're not allowed to. It's, 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 it's one, it's taboo. Two, it's against the industry-wide safety bulletin, number one. And number two, um, it's super important that that uh, chain of custody remain that way all of the time. Yeah. Did you did you see Hannah when they were doing these film shots? Did you see Hannah pass the gun to directly the actor uh, every time? Hannah Gutierrez had this thing where she would kind of like load firearms and run around and just like haphazardly place them places. She was uh, we were filming a scene where uh, Alice Baldwin and a kid are kind of like walking in on a horse, and we were shooting through a window. And she came in and just like left a repeater rifle there and just like ran off like inside the building, just like leaning against the wall. And even uh, the 16th the day of the misfire, she did the same thing where she left a repeater rifle in the, uh, she just opened the door to the cabin, set it by the door, said, oh, this is a hot gun, and then just runs off. Um, so left it unattended. Yeah. Now there was, there was uh, guns unattended all the time on the set. Um, there was also property assistance handling firearms and not just the armor. <clears throat> Which is a big no-no. Yeah, no, it's usually the armor. Because the way I understood it, and like I said, I'm new to this, is that uh, Hannah gives a, she gives a gun to the first AD, the AD opens the yeah, the cylinder, or he can open yeah, the cylinder and check. It, but it's the, the armor is the one in charge of it. Okay. So an armor is there with a flashlight up the barrel, and going through the cylinders, um, and like with a repeater, like a six, like a six shooter, mm -hmm. you'd go through the, the the barrel seven times, you know, to yeah. make sure that you've gone all the way through. Um, it doesn't leave the charge of the AD. Or, I'm sorry, the armor. Yeah. It, it's not supposed to be in that case. <coughs> it's, it's always supposed to be in in their charge, and it's literally to limit. It's literally just there to limit um, exposure to the weapon. Like the, the weapons, the uh, like we proper weapons handling on a set uh, is taken very seriously and is literally the armor, the actor, from the actor to the armor. It doesn't wind up in other people's hands. It shouldn't wind up in other people's hands. It is very alien for it to wind up in other people's hands. It's very normal for the first assistant director to check it, but not physically in their hands and inspect it. So it's 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 so outside of the realm of normality that you know it would surprise me if the first lady didn't know how to check a firearm, you know. Okay. And did you ever hear of them shooting cans? I know that there's this rumor going around in the media. So yeah, um, the the you know, plinking thing. Um, I never personally witnessed this. That being said, gunfire happened a lot on the set between setups. Like not while we're actively shooting. We had always assumed it was the National Guard Armory that's about five miles away. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of in, in hindsight, it would be very weird to hear um, small arms fire, like handgun fire, because it sounded it always was like pop, 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 pop. It wasn't it was never like a assault rifle or anything like that or rapid, you know, rapid fire. It was always a pop, 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 pop. Um, yeah, I mean like handgun stuff. Uh, and the National Guard is close, and actually, from the time you guys were filming, we're, we were having uh, recalls. Okay. So, okay, so you guys were... That might, that might have been it, but I don't know. Well, yeah, and I'm used to hearing it, though. I'm used to hearing it at uh, the... Um, closer to I-14 over by Santa Fe Studios. I mm -hmm. hear it all the time there when you guys are shooting over there. Yeah. But, um, 
you know, that's, that's much closer to, you know, Santa Fe, Maine and, and all that stuff. But um, the, the thing is, where we're shooting at Bonanza Creek, there's just a big hill, like, in between the National Guard Armory and Bonanza Creek Ranch. Yeah. But I will say, there in between takes, there were a lot of um, small arms fire, but I personally have never witnessed any clinking or any of that stuff. Like, I personally will not witness any of that um, or knew about it's going on. Okay. Cool. Well, I mean... Describe the first explosion. Describe the first explosion. Um, In more detail. Oh, yeah. yeah. So to describe what happened with the popper is um, we were in between setups and we were changing a battery on the camera. Uh, uh, so it was myself, my... We had a day playing utility, Sean Smith. He was there. He was changing the battery. I was t- about 10 feet from the porch where the uh, popper was. Um, we had an operator there, and um, I think they were. Uh, they, I know they were reloading to add another popper on, and it went off like right over everybody's head. Freaked everybody out. My ears started ringing. I know my Amy started like getting really upset. You know, it comes down with a bunch of debris you know, and stuff. Um, it's like filled with dust and, and like little pieces of wood and stuff. So it popped all over us. And there was a special effects person there. Like he had a. He had the de- like the detonator in his hand, um, oh. but to to be aware, like like whenever there's special effects explosions between takes, there's not supposed to have any power to them. They're supposed to be pulled from power, um, and that that you know that that the, yeah that happened. That was it was kind of like a like a description of what happened. And it's not uncommon for for stuff like that to happen on set. No, it's very uncommon. Like, it's I've never had it happen. I've okay. never had any kind of special effects explosion show up. Like, in my tenure career, I've never had a, uh, a special effects misfire. Because all of their stuff is, is based on batteries. And the moment that they um, the moment that they call cut, they make everything safe. Everything's key-driven. You have to have a key to pop anything. Okay. So they pop the keys, and then they pull the power. Okay. Um, everything is made to be incredibly safe around special effects because... You know, they can go from small poppers all the way to big 50 gallon gasoline explosions. You know? yeah. And I've been a part of, you name it, I've been a part of it. And I've never seen something like that. And that was an immediate red flag. Um, okay. And should have been a red flag for the uh, producers who were present. Cool. Just take a quick bathroom break. Yeah. No, sure. And then you can see, you wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. Did you want? For sure. Okay. Just I'm going to go back live. Yes. Okay. Let me ask you this question. Did you at any time see... Uh, the props master, props assistant, uh, managed those guns for Hannah, the armor? Mm-hmm. I saw uh, Nicole, the property assistant, handling firearms pretty regularly. And by handling, was it just handing the, the gun off to the actor, or was it uh, yeah. loading the gun? And I, I never saw her load a weapon, but I definitely saw her running around with firearms. My assumption is, and this is my assumption, it would be to hand out the firearms to the multiple extras and cast members who were there but it, it regularly um it was more than just hannah handling firearms as, as a matter like i said the, the second accidental discharge was nicole shooting herself in the foot with the blank yeah okay at close range it still hurts i heard that the powder in it kind of exactly Powder yeah. um, and sometimes they can kill because uh, it is like a crimped shell, so the shell sometimes can rip. Yeah. Is there any time do do they ever use live ammunition? On a normal film set, you will never see live ammunition, and it is it is super important that it stays that way 
it is every studio's policy that you can't even carry a firearm, that they ask you not to carry a firearm even in your car. Just in case a round from your firearm winds up in a jacket pocket that winds up on the floor that then winds up in the... You, you just cannot carry live ammunition on a set. It is the rule everybody knows. It's just a flat no. Okay. Um, What about Dave Halls? Tell me more about him. How was his? Be what was his behavior? Sure. sure. Uh, Dave Halls uh, is a very aloof man, um, very unaware, but very high strung. Um, I've worked with Dave Halls on a previous show. He's not a good assistant director. He is always rushing. Um, he's always, you know, trying to come in on time and rarely doing it. Uh, him, he loves to cut corners, like when it comes to rehearsals or safety meetings or uh, <laughs> explaining what's going on. Um, during the course of the show, I actually had several several serious conversations with Dave Hall about, we need rehearsals. We need to know what's going on. We need to know, um, you know, why, like, there was a day, October 8th, we were filming a saloon scene, I believe it was the 8th, 8th? No. It was the seventh day of shooting, which I think was the 15th. I had a, I had a conversation with Dave Hall. 14th. 14th. Uh, I had a conversation with Dave Halls about um, why he was packing the set with background actors when we haven't even seen the shot. We don't even know what the shot is. We have no rehearsal of the actor. The actor is still getting hair and makeup done. But he's packing the set with everybody, and he tells me, oh, I'm just trying to get ahead. I'm like, well, you're putting us behind by doing this. Like, you don't set background unless you have a shot. Nothing is set before the camera knows what's going on. But in his mind, he would try and get ahead by doing that. Um, he seemed sometimes confused. There was a conversation I had with him on Sunday, October, if it was the 20th, 19th, 17th, October 17th, day of 10 of shooting. Uh, we had a 12 p.m. call time. Uh, our prelim for that day was 10.30, which was a good call time. 10.30 is a good call time. Um, and I had a conversation with Dave Halls. Uh, uh, Dave, why'd you push call time two hours? Because um, we, were, we were filming in a gully. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about 12 feet deep, high sand walls. Um, so obviously you lose your son a lot faster because it goes behind the walls of the gully. And I'd ask Dave, because they were all panicking about light, Dave, why'd you push call time two hours? And he said, well, it's because I wanted more daylight. Dave, that's the wrong way. You pull call for that. Um, well, no, no, I, I wanted more daylight. Was, well, Dave, 1030 would have given us more daylight to use. So why did you push calls, you don't understand. It's this whole matrix of actor availability and, 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 you know, when we can shoot and turn around times, which none of that kind of stuff factored in. Um, to my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, when he, he, he then said, uh, he wanted lunch, he wanted lunch uh, to happen right at sunset, but you know, gullies, your son sets two hours early. Yeah. And so Helena had been complaining to me, like, about it. And uh, that's kind of what spurred the conversation with Dave Halls, because, you know, Helena had been literally just like, oh, uh, we have no light, I have no time. And then later on in the day, it, it bit us as well, because we're only, we're limited to how long we can have a child after. You can't push them past a certain time. And because we pushed our call time later, we lost our kid earlier. And so, once again, at the end of the day, we were completely rushed. Um, I remember every take having to move the camera. I mean, this is a Western. You know, I've got, I got a 60-pound camera. I've got a, you know, a 20-pound head and, and, you know, 10-pound sticks. I'm having to carry it all as one, just everywhere, every single take, because we were so rushed at the end. Um, Back is still in pain. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of stuff to be carrying around. Yeah, um, I had multiple conversations with Dave Hall 
about safety and about rehearsals and about um, and about you know slowing down so that we can speed up. You know what I mean? You know, do things right once instead of having to do them ten times because we don't know what's going on, which is commonly what happened. What was his response to that? Uh, we don't have enough time. This is a twenty-one day shoot. Um, I, I'm doing the best I have at twenty-one days. You know, it was very uh, just immediately dismissive. Um, there was a conversation on Wednesday, October 20th, I had with him because they sent us the lunch early at about 11.40. Um, they sent us the lunch so that they could rehearse without the crew there. It's a common practice to have a private rehearsal with the director and the cast. It's mm -hmm. very common. What's not common is then not marking that. So what we usually do, and I, I brought up Dave, I was like, Dave, why don't you just keep the camera department here so we can lay marks and block everything? I'm trying to get people turned back around after lunch faster. Okay, but um, it'll kind of help us all know what's going on. Because there's another scene with guns. Uh, a script goes off and somebody falls to their knees. And, and yeah, it was another, another gun scene. And I had brought it up, I was like, Dave, why don't you just keep the camera department, a few of us with camera department here so we can put down marks so we know what's, what's going on. And once again, it's the same kind of thing. This is a 21 day shoot, man. It was immediately dismissive. So, okay. We bagged our cameras, got them ready you know, for lunch, we cover all the cameras, make everything safe, turn off the power to everything and walk away. Um, and uh, there had been a moment where Helena was just like, oh, can one of you come back to Mark? And then I came back and, you know, explained that Dave Hall wanted us to leave for lunch. And she's like, okay, no problem, go ahead. And so I walked in back to lunch. Um, and it, it, I think that saved them eight minutes in total. Um, and then we came back and nobody knew what was going on. Um, so there was, a, there was a consistent pattern of that. Comfort, being confronted about doing it right, doing it safely, doing Mark's and immediately being dismissed. And I had these, more than Dave Halls, I had this conversation as well with Ro about needing the rehearsals and needing the time so that we could do things right. Very specifically on day seven, I had two conversations with her. Um, one, the second conversation was specifically about set safety and slowing down and, you know, you're the unit production manager, you have the power to show up here to set and kind of, and, and tell, you know, Dave to do it right. Yeah. Let's back up a little bit to the being on set because I know there's base camp and then you make your way up and then you get onto well the church setting. Sure. Um, did you did you get to experience that church setting area? Yeah. The yeah. Before you walked off, or were you guys at another scene? Uh, are you talking specifically about October twenty first? Because I was not there for that. Uh, October twentieth. October twenty first. October twenty first. You went. October First week. To recover your uh, stuff October that morning. First, that call time, we recovered our things. October 20th, we were still filming in the Gali, which was at the... Oh, okay. So that was the first day of filming at the church on October yeah. 21st. Uh, it wasn't the first day we filmed near the church. We used the church exterior um, in, in week one, I think day four or five. We shot the exterior of the church. Uh, the first interior day was October uh, 21st. Uh, Hannah, the armor, does she... I know she... Did she carry the guns, or did she use uh, some kind of cart or something to put her guns on her yeah, armor? Carrying guns like a, like a bundle of sticks under her arm. Did she? Do you remember a gray Rubbermaid two-tier cart? Uh, there was a couple of those on set. I mean, one that was specifically to her. Not to the best of my recollection, do I know it? But I don't really keep track of other people's. Okay, not sure. Uh, the only carts that like. Were not my department was like set decorators always put their cards next to ours, which was like a big wooden two tier card. Yeah, um, but uh, that was a set decorators. Ours was a our, we used these metal cards, uh, um, but I, I don't know like, what, what hand I was using. Okay, perfect. I think, uh, I mean, anything else that you can tell me? Yeah, yeah. Um, something to mention is uh, so there was a lot of retaliatory behavior. Um, I had brought up to production about the, you know, I'm sure you've heard, you know, the whole housing situation. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why, of course, I, I told you it's because of us falling asleep at the wheel. I don't want that to happen to anybody because it's happened to me. I also brought up, you know, I've had these conversations about rehearsals and doing things right and all this other stuff. And um, 
they immediately started calling other camera people uh, on day seven. Uh, I had a conversation with one of the producers, Robert Dean. He's the uh, financing producer uh, with Buffalo 8. And he came up to me and said, <clears throat> you know, uh, I'm, I'm a New Mexican born and bred. I came up in Las Cruces. And I, you know, the other producers, they, they really, they want you done, but you know, I want to take care of you. I want to make sure that you guys are taken care of and have a place, you know? And I was like, okay, well, cool. I really appreciate that. You know, none of us on this show want to leave. Um, you know, we just all want to be safe and, and make it home to our families. And, uh, and he's like, yeah, no, I totally get that. Within an hour, I received a phone call from a friend of mine named Colmar Nichols. He's a, he's a non-union camera operator. And he asked me, what's going on in your show? He's like, one of my best friends, you know, on the show. Uh, I had confirmed with um, uh, another friend of mine, Alan Herinick, uh the weekend leading up to this uh to, to the to the incident that he had received a phone call from Robert Dean to, to replace us. Um, a friend of ours, Alexander Paul, uh, who is a union guy, he received um, he received messages and phone calls from Robert Dean, Ro Walters, and Gabrielle Pickle all about replacing us. Um, and he forwarded us uh, via text message and email from Gabrielle Pickle on October 17th, 18th, October 18th, he had sent us a message that he had just received from Gabrielle Pickle asking Xander about uh, getting on the phone with Roe, Robert Dean, and Gabrielle about onboarding this week. Um, they, they had been trying to replace us all the way until we had left, basically, and they just, from my understanding, were particularly successful. Um, until the day of, they found some kids that were not in the union that would come, come work on the show. Um, Mikey Slavich and, and Michael Castillo. Uh, one kid I've never seen in my life. And then another guy who was out of Los Angeles who was leaving back to Los Angeles the next day, um, who had just been in town and knew Helena. Um, they, uh, yeah, they, they were looking for a new camera department going back to day seven. Who's Robert Dean? Robert Dean is the financing producer for the show. He's, you'll find him on the call sheets, and I'm not sure you'll find him on the crew list. Um, he's a local producer here in New Mexico. He works for a company called Buffalo 8, which was the direct financier of this movie, along with a company called Bandit. Um, they're basically massive hedge funds um, that all of the producers work for. Uh, very inexperienced in its own kind of world. They were set up to now like work as like a, you know, they're, they're just hedge funds designed to, to fund ultra low budget movies. And Robert Dean is the local producer who works for Buffalo 8, which is a subsidiary of Bondit. Um, but he's like kind of like a local fixer for these producers in a way. Uh, you'll see him on the call sheets, but he's not, I don't think he's in the crew list. Would you mind emailing me those call sheets? Uh, yeah, I can, I'll put them together and I'll send them to you. I have your card if you want to just give me another copy, though. Do you have my card? Uh, yeah, it was sent to me, but I'll, I'll take a hard copy if you don't mind. Yeah. Anything else you can get off chest? You'll find them on the production side, actually. Um, other financiers? Uh, other financiers? See, I never personally met other financiers besides mm -hmm. what was that oh clinger yeah nathaniel clinger and, and uh, ryan winterstern um they're they were controlling producers of the show uh, i think i told you earlier they were always on set aware of everything and they took a very hands-on role with uh with the show um very specifically actually and i do want to talk to you about this ryan winter winterstern sure. yeah. is that the young guy He's a, well, they're all young. <laughs> they're all children. Um, no. I, I've, I have more experience in the porta potty on set than any of them have on set. <laughs> um, okay, I have them here. Ryan Wis Winters Winterstern, yeah, producer, Ryan, it says. Yeah, Ryan Winterstern, he was the most hands on producer. He's also a yeller. 
um, he would he would have these very animated big conversations with Dave Hall's like nearby set. Um, Helena had very specifically told me he was a screamer in production meetings where he would just start yelling at people. Mm-hmm. Um, he also uh, this. This is a, more of a secondhand thing, but we, Russell, had told me the day we were leaving um, that Helena had gone to the uh, to the trailers uh, at base camp to try and talk to Ryan about like making this right uh, with the camera department, and uh, and Reed was stopped by Ro Walters outside, like "Don't go in there" because uh, R- Ryan was absolutely screaming at Helena fucking piece of shit cameraman like that kind of stuff like mm-hmm. very angry very angry. um he yeah he he always had a very very big role in the show but also a very he was also hands-on he had a walkie all the time but he's very angry often um he you know he was a big one that was obviously pushing the budget and pushing the um, pushing the lack of time and, and whatnot. Um, he was the least approachable one. I had never personally had a conversation with him because he was so unapproachable. My personal conversation with, um, that's another thing I want to bring up with your shit. Um, I, I had a conversation with Nathaniel Klinger um, on October 17th. October 17th at RAP. I had a conversation with Nathaniel Klinger about set safety, housing, and his response was all about budget. And the conversation with him was, um, it started out with this, he was walking away with Ryan and I was like, hey, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Cause um, you guys have like been very hostile towards us. Um, you know, you guys are always kind of looking and staring at us and pointing at us and he's like, yes, yeah, cause you threatened to leave the show. I'm like, yeah. Because you guys aren't meeting your guys' end of the bargain, and you guys made a deal with us. You know, Roe, Ro, when we were getting on this show, made a deal with us for housing, and we all agreed to it. You know, anytime we needed it, on a week-to-week basis, not every day, not that everybody's asking you for housing for the whole run of show, but all of us asked for housing, and you, most of us have it in writing, and you guys have kind of gone back on that. And his response was, well, Roe doesn't have the authority to make those kind of choices, which is not... True, a unit production manager makes the deals with the crew. That's what they do. Well, I've heard that she's, you know, handles finance and mm-hmm. a lot, you know, a big part of of other stuff that she's in charge of. Mm-hmm. Her and her and Gabrielle Pickle are directly in charge of that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you know, and this kind of further shows like the, the level of like micromanagement that the producers were trying to do on the show. That's a tangent. Um, Nathaniel, he has this conversation with me about it, and he says, well, at the end of the day, it's unfair to give you guys housing and not everybody else. I was like, first off, no, everybody makes their own deal. But second of all, if anybody else needs housing, give it to them. It's a safety thing. If people are asking you for housing, it's because they're too tired to drive home. These are punishing days. It's a hard show, and it doesn't need to be. And at that point, I explained to him that we need to have rehearsals and we need to block and we need to know what we're doing for the day because that's how we can save time. The easiest way you can save money in your budget is to have shorter days. And the way you shorten your day is to have a rehearsal to block to explain what's going on because at no point does anybody in this crew know what's going on. And I told him, like, if you're trying to save money, you need to think outside of the box. And... And he said it was a, like, he was very friendly and positive after that. And I had thought that the conversation was a, was a positive one. You know, he said he was going to go back and talk to the rest of the producers and that uh, he appreciated me for, you know, coming up to him and talking to him. And it was hours later when we got the uh, text message from um, Xander Paul uh, with a screenshot from an email from Gabrielle Pickle saying, uh, asking to onboard onto the show to replace us. Who's Zender Paul? He's not on the show. He was one of the guys that they were trying to hire in to replace us. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, a conversation that I had thought was positive, you know, it, it was just kind of like immediately ignored. And then they tried to replace us. 
the, over the weekend, the, over that weekend leading up to the 20th, 21st, they were actively trying to replace the camera department. So they were already trying to, you thought you had to work things out, but they were already trying, they were in the process of already being in contact with other people to replace you guys. So either way, they were going to kick you guys off, whether you left or not. Yeah. Is it, is it, it was always, it was, it became a personal thing, and I really believe it was a personal thing with uh, Gabrielle. Because the morning we were leaving, Gabrielle came to the camera truck uh, at around, I want to say like 7.50, something around there. She came to the camera truck and she um, she walks right up to me and me and Jonas worked us. We were, um, we were taking my camera cart and we were about to lift it up and put it in my, my truck. She comes up to me and says, you need to get off the property immediately before I call security and have you removed. And then she storms off and I ask, is that is there anything else? I said no, and she was like shaking with anger, which was this is a business. This is all this is, and the decisions that I'm making are purely for my own safety, and my crew are making you know personal decisions for their own safety as well. There's no emotion in this. I've been on a lot of shows. I've done a lot of big movies. I've done a lot of little movies. I, you know, I've traveled all over the country. Like, this is a business. This isn't personal. I have said that so many times to all of the people on the show. Nothing is personal with this. I'm just watching out for myself. And Gabrielle came up to me in a fit of rage. And everything was personal to her. And when I was packing up after I had packed everything into my car, I was about to leave, you know, I walked up to her to shake her hand and say, you know, I hope you have a good rest of your show. And I walked up here, I was like, Gabrielle, you know, once again, I'm sorry. Um, so I didn't work out. I'll be able to rest of your show. And she screams in my face, bye. Oh. I said, okay. I got out of my car, started driving. Um, I drafted an email in response to Gabby because she did respond to my email, um, explaining why I had to take my tools, which was she didn't pay um, anybody's box rental and she doesn't pay in advance for anything. Um, as a matter of fact, they were behind the payments already with the camera rental house. So I wasn't gonna get paid for any of that year either. Um, uh, they were already behind on payments for everything. So I had every right to take my tools. You know, there was nothing paid in advance. There was no contract that existed for, for tools. So yeah, I'm gonna take my tools. <laughs> They're mine. Yeah. Like it's a conflict of interest for me to leave anything on set. As a matter of fact, Michael Castillo, the, uh, the camera assistant that had replaced me, you know, he asked me to leave my carts. And I was like, it's a conflict of interest for me to leave stuff here. Man. It's nothing personal with you, dude. You're cool, but I just gotta leave my stuff here. And um, then uh, he offered to rent them from me. And I said, I just I can't do it. It's just, it's not you. It's just, it's not good for me to leave gear here on, this, on the set. It's just, this is purely a business thing. It's, it has nothing to do with you, Michael. You're, Totally cool. And he had, he had asked almost everybody on my crew as we were leaving to leave gear. And we were all like, all right, I just can't do it. It's, it's not you guys, it's us. And they did wind up getting a, the set decorator cart actually, they they uh, had gotten it from them. And it's like a two tier wooden cart that's about, you know, 10 feet long, this huge thing. But they were able to get that to move the lenses and stuff around. Um, but we sat there, we actually helped them build their camera, you know, in Video Village, you know, we were taking our gear, but at the same time we were helping the guys coming in we try and put together a package. They had no stuff to do. We explained where all the parts were. We explained where everything in the truck was. My loader sat with uh, Mikey Slavich and told him, you know, this is the shot footage. You can't touch this until the post house gets back to you. This is the unshot stuff that you can use in the camera. Um, we tried to do what we could to help those guys because it wasn't personal. Nothing was personal. Just we couldn't. The conditions on the show were just terrible. They were abysmal and they were dangerous. And it just, uh, it affected all of us. I mean, we never, I've never left the show in 10 years. I've been on some crazy jobs. Yeah. But I've never left the show. Okay. Um. Well, also, there was a rattlesnake um, incident. <laughs> that I completely forgot about. There was a rattlesnake incident where we continued to film right next to a rattlesnake on October 16th. What? Yeah, I can really for face that one. On October sixteenth, uh, we were filming at the Travelers uh, Travelers Lodge, the, the cabin where they had the misfires. Yeah, there's a rock outcropping right next to the front of it. It's a it's a it's a wooden cabin uh, wooden cabin 
where two of the two of the four walls are exposed to the outside, the rest of it's kind of under a dirt berm. And the right side of it, there's actually also like a rock outcropping right next to the door. And uh, it was reported actually by Dave Halls, and he's like, oh, that's a rattlesnake. Um, and so the snake trend wrangler went and tried to get it, but couldn't because it scared it back. It like booped it on the snake accidentally and it went inside the rock, rock outcropping. And it was a it was a baby rattlesnake along with a basically in a den. And uh, she tried for like two minutes to get it, but then the decision was made to like abandon trying to get it, get it, and we continued to film right next to it. Huh. I personally made the decision not going anywhere near it because whilst I wanted to see the rattlesnake because rattlesnakes are cool, um, they had decided eh, we'll just shoot right next to it. That's that's safe. <laughs> And whose decision was that to just stay there and film? That was Dave Hall's. And those, uh, can you repeat that date? That was October 16th. That approximately, because the sun was going down, I would say that was approximately 5.36 o'clock. The sun had gone behind the hill that's like right there next to the, to the set. It was getting dark. Darker. Any horsing around with that you personally saw with the with the firearms or other props? Uh, no, I didn't personally witness any kind of horsing around. Um, because I know they're cool antique guns. You know that they have the yeah, long rifles, I, the revolvers. I, I know that Hannah is pretty proud of them, but like I don't. I never, I never saw any like horsing around or any of that stuff. Um, to keep in mind, I'm one of the most busy departments on set. I am always on set. Um, I'm always paying attention to... I work directly with Helena. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I spend my time with her. And, and, and that's where my world kind of like really is. And, and I, I'm not paying attention to, you know, the set decorator or the armor and stuff like that. Because it's just not... That's not my world. My world revolves literally around the DP and making sure she gets what she wants. Okay. Anything else you want to add? I believe that's right now what I have for you right, right now at this moment. We can always follow up later. Yeah, great. Um, great, great, great. Whether it's uh, via telephone okay. or I can come down if I have time. Sure. Yeah. So. yeah. If, you know, if, uh, if, I, if I think of anything, I'll you know, definitely want to stay in touch. All right. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching this episode. We have an entire playlist for this series linked down below, including a super special video, including Jensen Ackles and even Alec Baldwin. See you again soon.